This evening begins the festival of Sukkot. As you can see, I have my sukkah up. I'm going to walk inside, and in this video, I'm going to share with you some teachings about the four species that we wave on the festival of Sukkot. Now, these four species are the palm branch, the myrtles, the willows, and the esrog fruit. Like many things in Judaism, the four species are interpreted in different ways. Some people see them as parts of the body, that the uh, palm branch is the spine, and the myrtle is the eye, and the willow is the mouth, and the esrog is the heart. And that's one way of seeing it. The interpretation that I like best is the one that sees them as different types of people within the Jewish community. And so I'm going to share that teaching with you along with a couple of stories. According to this set of teachings, the palm branch represents the scholar who has a great deal of knowledge, but doesn't always put that knowledge into practice. I suppose you would say this is the ivory tower intellectual. So it's tall and stately, palm tree is beautiful, but there isn't any real odor to it. There's no fragrance to it. There's no dispersing of the teachings to the world. And so that's the palm branch, and it usually comes with a little holder like this where we will put the myrtles and the willows. The myrtle represents the person who doesn't have a lot of Torah knowledge, but who does the mitzvahs. They keep kosher, they keep Shabbos, they give charity, they do the good deeds for other people. A myrtle is not a tall, stately tree like a palm. It's a kind of a scrubby tree, maybe often like a bush, but it has a beautiful fragrance. Myrtles were traditionally carried at weddings. They had myrtle at our wedding because it would give off such a lovely fragrance. So that's the simple person, the simple Jew, who does what they need to do and doesn't necessarily analyze it a lot. The willow represents the person who doesn't have a lot of Torah knowledge and also isn't very observant. They don't keep kosher, they don't keep Shabbos, they don't put on tefillin, they don't daven every day, etc. Nevertheless, they are still a Jew. They are still part of the community. Now, traditionally, this was interpreted as representing humility because a willow can bend. And so the willow person was the one who would come very humbly on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. They didn't know the prayers. They hadn't been observant all year, but they poured out their heart to God like the man who said, Lord, I can't read the prayer book. I don't know what to do, but I'll, here, I give you the whole book and you can put the prayers together. As I mentioned earlier, these three species, the palm, the myrtle, and the willow are bound together, and they often come with a little holder like this. You could just tie them together with string, but this is much nicer. A lot of people refer to this whole thing as a lulav, even though it, technically the lulav is the palm, but this is the lulav that has the first three species. Now the fourth species, that one doesn't come tied together. That one stands by itself. The fourth species is the fruit of the esrog tree. It's a citrus. In Hebrew, it's Eitz Prihadar, the fruit of goodly trees, beautiful trees. And it's been traditionally passed down to us that it's this particular fruit. Now, the esrog is beautiful to look at, and it also has a lovely fragrance. It represents the person who is both a scholar and observant. This is the from Jew, we would say. Such a person has both the knowledge of why we do the mitzvahs, and they do the mitzvahs. But on the other hand, sometimes they separate themselves from the rest of the community. 
And with that, I'm going to share a story that happened to me recently. As most of you who go online know, a lot of sites require you to use a screen name. They even say, don't give out your personal information. And so I have used a various different identities or different words or something on Rooster613 on some sites. And there's a story behind that that I'll share some other time. But anyway, I was on this one site and I said something about vegetarianism. And this very orthodox looking guy, you know, the black coat, the hat, the beard, the whole thing. For some reason, vegetarianism set him off and he starts ragging on me about it. And he says, you know, I don't even think you're really a Jew. You know, you're probably a phony. I'm no, but, And I said to him, look, you don't even know who I am. For all I know, I could be standing next to you at the Minion tomorrow morning. And then he says to me, I think not. I'm very particular about who I daven with. A perfect example of the Esrog. A guy who puts himself on a pedestal and doesn't want to associate with anybody that he doesn't think is worthy to pray with him. I didn't think it was worth my time to tell him the old saying that says, Nine scholars do not make a minion, but one ordinary person does when they join them. So the tradition has always been that ten Jews make a minion, period. Which brings you to another wonderful story that happened to me a number of years ago in New York. When I, back when I still had a speaking circuit, I was scheduled to speak at a conference, and it was right after Rosh Hashanah. So I arranged to stay with a family in Brooklyn. And when we went to the synagogue, the rabbis announced they were going to do Tashlik, the tradition where you symbolically cast your sins into the sea. They were going to do that downstairs by the mikveh which is a natural body of water, but I live out in the country. I'm used to going to a lake or a river. And there was another guy in the group that looked at me and he caught on to that. He comes over afterward and says, look, years ago, I also lived in the country. I know how you feel about this. Come home with me for lunch and afterwards, we'll walk to a park where you can see New York Harbor and we'll do it there. So that's what we do. And we're walking into the park and there's a little group of Jews you know, very orthodox people in long black coats standing over there, and they start waving and gesturing, just, come on, Jews, ye didn't, ye didn't come. And we go over there, and in fact, they needed two more people for a minion so that they could say the afternoon prayer and say Tashlik. They didn't know who we were. We were walking in off the street. We could have been anybody. But we were Jews, and we made a minion. And afterwards, I found out that the leader of this group was a Rebbe from a small town, and these were his disciples, just a very small little synagogue, one of the storefront places. And he laid, literally laid his hands on everybody's head and blessed us all for a very good year. And that's the way it should be, that the whole community should come together. And so the observant scholar person has to come and join with the other less than perfect, so to speak, members of the community. And we should also note that all of these species grow near water and that during Sukkot, we add the prayer for rain to the liturgy. And we also, we wave these in the six directions. We wave them to the east, the south, the west, the north, above, below. And some people then bring this to the heart. And anthropologists have suggested that this is the remnants of an ancient rainmaking ceremony ancient shamanic practice. And before you laugh at that, remember that the Sefer Yetzirah, one of the more ancient mystical texts, traditionally attributed to Adam and Eve, and whether you take that literally or not, it definitely predates the giving of the Torah. And it talks about the six directions. It talks about how God sealed the universe with permutations of the letters of his name. So like he sealed one direction with Yod Vav He, the other with He Vav Yod, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the very boundaries of the universe are the six directions. And this is why another interpretation of waving the Lulav says that God is everywhere. God is everywhere in the universe. And with that, I'll wish you a Chag Sameach, a happy holiday when you celebrate Sukkot, celebrate the harvest with beauty, 
joy, and peace.